Thank you, Mark. It's, uh, it's a real blessing to be here. Uh, no, thank you. It's a real blessing to be here, and uh, you know, what a way to start our Shabbat, uh, by honoring our Creator, honoring our King, honoring our God. He is here in this place as we are worshiping Him, and I believe He is with you at home as you are tuning in to us today. Uh, this morning's message is based on a Torah portion known as Ha'azinu, which means give ear. And so we'll be looking at this Torah portion this morning. On our first slide, we see the introduction to the Torah portion from the, the chapter before. And these are Moses' final words to the people of Israel. And he says, Gather to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I might speak these words in their hearing and call heaven and earth to witness against them. Then Moses spoke in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. And here it begins. Give ear, O Ha'azinu, O heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. So Moses' final words to the nation of Israel are in the form of a song. So we see it on the next slide that a song really softens the hard words that Moses is about to give his people. He knows and he sees prophetically the dangers lying ahead for this nation. And he is warning his people to stay close to the God who saved them, to the God who brought them out of Egypt. So he presents this harsh warning in the form of a song that is really softening the blow, but also a song really gets stuck in your head. You know that tune, that melody that you just can't shake. You just keep singing it. And it seems that Moses intended his final words to ring in the ears of Israel and ring down the generations that they would remember and take heed to this warning. So let's have a look at this song together. We start in verse 3 with praise. As you do with any, any song and any psalm in the Bible, you start with praising God. He says in verse 3, I proclaim the name of the Lord. Ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. Our focus should always start heavenward. Focusing on him. Focusing on his faithfulness. His perfection. That his ways are right. His ways are true. Sometimes you and I don't understand, God, what is going on? What are you doing? What are you doing in my life? But Moses is reminding us with his early words in this song that God's ways are truly just and perfect, that he hasn't forgotten about us, but that he is at work in our lives for our good. Righteous and upright is he. In the next slide, we see a brief summary of the next few verses. In verse 6 is the first place in the Bible where God is called Israel's father. And so he's bringing back to remembrance the love relationship between him and his people. Verse 10, he keeps Israel as the apple of his eye. Verse 11, he carries Israel on his wings like an eagle. Now you can imagine an eagle trying to escape danger, carrying its young on its wings. And below there might be people on the ground going to use archery to throw a bow and arrow at their, their direction. That arrow has to go through the mother bird to hit the young. The mother bird is a defense from any danger coming against the young on its back. Other birds will carry their young in their talons, so they're dangling beneath them. Whereas here the picture is a bird carrying on its back, protecting from any danger. And that is what God is saying, I am that shield, I am the one standing between you, Israel, and your enemies. If they're going to get to you, they have to come through me first. It's a beautiful picture of his love for his people. And in verse 12, it says that Israel was led by God alone. There was no foreign God among her. And he is bringing back to their remembrance that first love, that first encounter with God Almighty. 
This song was to be sung through the generations. It was to repeat again and again to remind the people of where they had come from, remind them of God's awesome work in the very beginning of the nation. A key phrase in the Bible again and again is remember. Remember what I have done. Remember my love. Remember. Us humans tend to forget. We focus on the now. We focus on what's happening right in front of us. And in so doing, we can say, God, where are you? I don't understand. And begin to turn away from him. But Moses is saying, remember. Remember his faithfulness in the past. Because he who was faithful back then remains the same today. On the next slide, we see how God gave Israel the best of everything. Verse 13, he made him ride in the heights of the earth that he might eat the produce of the fields. He made him draw honey from the rock and oil from the flinty rock, curds from the cattle and milk of the flock with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan, the very finest, and goats with the choicest wheat. And you drank wine, the blood of the grapes. So he's describing the prosperity and the blessings that were already coming Israel's way and which they were about to enter into. God's love for us is that he provides and he blesses. But the next verse gives us the but of the song. It says in verse 15, but Jeshurun, Jeshurun here is a nickname for Israel and we're going to look at this nickname as we proceed. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, you grew thick, you are obese. And then he forsook God who made him and scornfully esteemed or Yinabel, the rock of his salvation. So growing fat here talks of having so much prosperity and so much going Israel's way that they're losing their spiritual fitness. They're enjoying the pleasures of life. But it's coming to a point where they're so relaxed in what they have and so enjoying it that they don't want the discipline of following God. They don't want the life of a disciple. And it says they grew fat and they kicked. And the word here to kick literally means to despise. It's amazing how someone can turn against the very one who's given so much. The very one who has been there so faithfully throughout, throughout the years. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. And scornfully esteemed or treated as a fool. That Yinabel is the same word we have in Nabal, the, the man who's described as a fool in the time of David, treated God as a fool and turned their back on him. On the next slide, we see verse 32. Their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Now there's some debate among the rabbis whether this verse is talking about Israel or about her enemies. But for one moment, I want to consider it in terms of looking at the people of Israel. That Sodom was known as a place of prosperity, was a place that was blessed. And they had, they had it all. We remember the story of Abraham and, and Lot and how Lot chose for himself the prosperous areas of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom was known for prosperity, but this prosperity was going to their head. And what was meant to be a blessing was becoming a poison, turning them away from God. And this is what Moses is re referring to as he's talking about the people of God, that the, the very blessings and the very prosperity that God has given them in his love and his care ultimately can be turned as a weapon of the enemy to turn them away from God, becoming a poison that they rely on instead of God himself. On the next slide, we're looking at the name Jeshurun. The Septuagint translation of this is beloved from the word agape that we know in the New Testament. The beloved of God, the loved of God. What a nickname. And this is the first time it's introduced in the scripture. The beloved of God. The Hebrew term literally, literally means upright one. It relates to being straight, doing things the straight and right way. Rabbi Samson Hirsch 
talks about that even upright Jeshurun, even the one who's known for his righteousness, was in danger as everything was going his way, as prosperity was coming, as he was being blessed left, right and center, he was in danger. In church life and in congregations of believers, we see people coming through the door often in times of difficulty. They are struggling with something, maybe there's some health issues, maybe they're alone and really need that comfort and encouragement. And they come, they get spiritual food, they get blessed, they turn to, to Yeshua as Messiah. But as time goes by, they get more established, they get financially well off, they get busy with their families. And soon we see less and less of them. And they're busy with other things. And the God who saved them doesn't seem to matter so much anymore. This is a message and a warning to you and I as we go through the seasons of life, as we enter those seasons of prosperity. Let's not forget the God who saved us. Let's keep that spiritual discipline in place of seeking him, of reading his word, of coming together and seeking him when it's possible in COVID times. In many ways, I believe God will call you and me also, Jeshurun. You are my beloved. And he sees us through Yeshua the Messiah as the upright one, as the one who has flawless character in him. But there is a warning to this upright one. Don't forget. Don't turn away. Remember the God who loved you and the God who saved you. In verse 17 on the next slide, we see the beginning of Israel's falling away and they sacrificed the demons not to God, to gods that did not know and of the rock who begot you. In other words, the rock who fathered you, you are unmindful and have forgotten the God who fathered you. A key phrase used again and again in this song I believe it's four times is that God is the rock, the rock of Israel, the steadfast, the faithful one, the one who is the bedrock foundation. But Israel here is sliding away from that rock onto uncertain ground. In a sense, you could say they're not building their lives on that rock anymore. They're building it on the sand. Next slide, verse 19. And when the Lord saw it, he spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, verse 20, I will hide. I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be. For they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no face. No faith, sorry. God hiding his face means that he's not responding in the same way when they're, they're seeking him. He doesn't seem to be there anymore. Where's his presence gone? It's as if he's leaving them to their own devices, letting them experience the fruit of their own choices. I will see what their end will be, he says. Verse 23 on the next slide. I will heap disasters on them. I will spend my arrows on them. They shall be wasted with hunger, devoured by pestilence and bitter destruction. The sword shall destroy outside. There shall be terror within for the young man and virgin, the nursing child with a man of gray hairs. So there's a wave of destruction beginning to come in different forms and shapes. There is the sword, there is terror, but there's also pestilence, a plague. There is hunger, there is disasters. And verse 28 is one of the key verses that I want to look at. It says that they, Israel in this case, are a nation, void of counsel, nor is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider the latter end. How could one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had surrendered them? He's saying, how come these disasters are happening? How come the, they are failing in battle? How come the enemies are driving them to flight? How come 
the pestilence and the plague is happening and there's hunger in the streets of Jerusalem. How come? Oh, that they were wise to understand why. That they would understand the path they have chosen and what has come their way. Does this have parallels with us today here in Australia? We have been so blessed. On the next slide, I asked the question, what has gone wrong with Australia? The blessings of God have been upon this nation. We have prospered and compared to so many others all over the world, we are all really, really rich. We've had it all and we've had a godly foundation. But our nation in the last years have accelerated a speedy departure from the God who saved us, the God who loved us, the God who has blessed us. And guess what? Things are beginning to go wrong. Could it be that even the whole scenario of what's happening right now with COVID actually relates to the judgments of God? God wants us not to end up like Sodom. He wants us to turn around and stop in the path that we are on. And so he allowed for Israel things to happen to wake them up and to bring them back to that first love. Oh, that we too were wise to see why these things have happened. That we were wise to understand and learn the lesson. Because God is looking for a response from his people. He's looking for us to to heed his warning and to turn back. That this song will ring in our ears as the things begin to go wrong and we say, God, I want to return to that first love. I want to return to you. That our nation would return to that foundation. As things go wrong, we tend to try to find someone to blame. Maybe it's our leaders. Maybe it's the government. Maybe it's the media. Maybe it's our prime minister or our premier. And yes, they are not without fault. They are humans and they're doing things as best they know. But in the midst of it, I believe that as we point fingers at them, there's always four fingers pointing back at us. Saying, oh, that we were wise to understand the fruit of the path that we have chosen as a nation. The Bible tells us of Daniel who began to intercede for the nation of Israel. And he began to pray, saying, God, forgive us, forgive me and my generations for what we have done. Now, Daniel is described in the Bible without ever any mention of any sin or any failure on his part. He is really one of the most upright people in the entire body of Scripture. Yet he says, God, forgive me. He begins to fast and pray for his nation. And he says, forgive me and my generations for what we have done. He recognized that he was in exile. And exile is not a place of blessing. It is because of the curse, because of the falling away. And he was affected by the falling away of Israel. And he lived his life in the exile as a result. And he, this righteous man, began to seek God and say, God, have mercy on your people. Have mercy on me. Bring us back to you. Restore the blessings that you had for us from the very beginning. Bring us back to your land. Bring us back to your holy temple and your presence. By extension, I'd say for Australia, Lord, have mercy on our nation. Bring us back to being a nation known for worshipping you. A nation known for having a fear of you. Lord, have mercy on our nation. Will you join me as we pray right now for Australia? Father God, I thank you. I thank you for your word and for the song that you gave Moses. A song that rings true through the generations. That you are a God who loves us, but you're also a God who doesn't want us to end up like Sodom. You are wanting us to turn around in our tracks and come back to you. And we lift up our nation before you. We are struggling in many ways. The prosperity that has been there is seeping away. People are losing their jobs, losing their livelihoods. People are frustrated and angry with what's going on. But in the midst of this, we pray that you'll turn this nation back to you. That you'll turn our eyes back to you, our saviour, our rock. And Lord, it begins with us as your people 
to humble ourselves and seek you and to get our lives in order. And as we've just gone through Yom Kippur, we pray that you will teach us to come back to you, to walk in your ways of purity and righteousness and truth, that you will cleanse us of secret sin and set us apart for you afresh. In the name of Yeshua we pray. Amen. Thank you.